All right, well, we'll get going. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to everyone for uh, being here and for joining this webinar. We're really excited to share this product and um, looking forward to uh, some of your questions. Uh, the way this works on our webinar is that there is a Q&A box. So if you have a question, please go to the Q&A. You should see it on the bottom of your screen and you can click in there and type a question. Um, we'll collect those questions throughout the uh, presentation and then answer them at the end. So feel free to throw them up as they come up. Um, and I will uh, go back to those and answer those at the end. And uh, you should be able to see my screen as well. So now um, I'm going to start off with the, a little overview of what the indicators dashboard is, and then we can go dive into how to use it a little bit more. Um, so the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative is a five-state cooperative focused on monitoring and evaluation of forest ecosystems and how they're changing over time. Uh, we started out as a Vermont monitoring cooperative uh, many years ago and transitioned in the last couple of years to this five-state model. Um, but as part of the transition, there was a request from the state of Vermont to look at how can we summarize a lot of information about forest ecosystems uh, into a single uh, online place to look at kind of a scorecard for the forests. And we thought this was a pretty neat idea and something that could be potentially scalable to other states. So we really worked on an earnest, in earnest on this about a year ago. Um, and then with a couple finishing touches over the last six months, we've launched it. And I'm uh, excited to kind of show you some of the things that you can do with it and some of the information you can get out. <clears throat> so the Forest Indicators Dashboard, the link is up there. You're welcome to go browse around. Um, it provides kind of an overview of the forest uh, in Vermont. And the idea is that we've summarized 33 key data sets in four broad categories. You can see those categories on the left here. Um, so these are key data sets that are summarized for a current year score. So how is the latest year of data compared to either a target or the long-term trend? And what is that long-term trend? Are things improving? Are they getting worse? Are they roughly staying the same? And we do this, uh, attempt to do this with easy to use graphs, explanations of uh, methods, and if needed, links to data sets. So we start out at a very broad level and then get more detailed as we go on to give people the information that they need to understand a particular trend. Um, but uh, what is a dashboard? Uh, I figured this was probably worth starting with. Um, these are really used heavily in the business world. Um, the idea is to give a quick snapshot of a lot of information. So instead of starting with a data table, how do you start with a chart, a graph, a map, or a trend line? And dashboards have become popular for understanding kind of complex interacting systems. Um, our forests are changing all the time and responding to different stressors. So this dashboard for forests makes sense. Why have a, do a dashboard in Vermont? Well, we want to know how are the forests doing? We look at things like forest structures. So what types of trees are where and how are they, uh, what condition are they in? We look at forest condition more broadly of how do we understand the, uh, the status of the trees, the status of the makeup of the forest. Uh, we look at stresses on the system, such as pollution or climate change. And we look at ecosystem services provided by forests. These are all ways that we can think about how forests are doing. So it's four nice buckets, but when you look at what it takes to understand each of those, it can be complex. Forest structure involves disturbance and changes in regeneration over time. Forest condition involves the effects of pests on uh, large swaths of the landscape, as well as individual tree responses to stress. Ecosystem services includes everything from biodiversity in our bird populations to stream macroinvertebrates to uh, maple syrup production. And looking at stress at the system, um, these are very dynamic systems such as uh, ozone, ozone pollution, mercury deposition, and others that are providing stress on that system. So we wanted to have a dashboard that would be an easy to use scorecard for our forests. Um, and we think this could be useful for educators, decision makers, and planners for understanding uh, and communicating how things are changing over time. And more importantly, it provides context and integration of information. This figure on the bottom right is probably one of my favorite graphs ever. And I always have to spend a fair bit of time explaining it to people. Um, this is looking at uh, the maximum area of a mapped for damages from different forest disturbances versus how often they occur. Really cool graph, but it takes a while to understand. So how do we do something that's a little bit um, quicker to get into and provide people pathways to get to this level of information if they want to go deeper. 
This started at the 2015 Vermont Monitoring Cooperative Conference. We had a working session on, is this something that's needed? And the resounding answer was yes. And the uh, corollary advice after that was, even if you can't get everything done perfectly, just get a lot of work done and see how much you can do. So we worked with UVM students on a design project uh, to mock up what the dashboard could look like and look at some other comparators. We did some initial code and script development in summer of 2017. And then we uh, went through a technical review with a lot of um, specialists from the state and uh, federal and nonprofit groups in Vermont to uh, look at how we can weight all these data sets together. Uh, so now we're here in summer of 2018 launching this effort. Looking at what it takes to have a data set in the dashboard, uh, it has to have a significant temporal record. There's lots of great data that's been collected out there for um, a year or two, but doesn't have that temporal depth that we need. Ideally, it has annual or near annual records. So we can look not just at the um, current score, but how the trend is uh, evolving over time and whether or not that trend is significant. We need high quality and representative data. So we don't want a lot of uh, data that says the same thing and we want that data to have been rigorously collected so that people can have trust in the output. And ideally it's institutionally supported data collection. So building this dashboard on projects that are, are likely to be ongoing because they have institutional support. So with that, I wanted to give just a quick overview of how the site is structured and then I'll actually navigate around the website a fair bit to show you um, what it might look like. So on the landing page, we have these categories. These categories bring together a number of different data sets and provide an overall score for that category. And that's shown here in the number. It's on a one to five scale. So 4.2 out of five is pretty good. Um, it also provides a circle. The color of the circle it describes a long-term trend. Are things increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? Um, so if scores are getting better, uh, you get a green circle. If scores are roughly staying the same, you have a yellow. If scores are getting worse over time, you get a red. Within each category, here's the stressors category. We provide um, a category score again at the top. And then you can see all the data sets and the corresponding weights that go into that score. So this is the, the full range of data sets that go into determining the stressor score. We also provide an overview of the category. And if you were to scroll down this page, you would see a, uh, more information on which stressors went into it and why they're included. Once you click on a particular uh, indicator here on the left, we've uh, selected precipitation acidity. You get information on the current year score again for this particular data set, so, and also the latest year of data. So we had 2016 data at the time. Um, so this uh, data set is a 3.9 out of five. And we score that relative to the ideal precipitation uh, or the ideal acidity of rain, which is 5.5. We also provide that long-term trend information as well as a graph of the data. Um, and so that's the basic anatomy of the dashboard. And I'll show you a little bit more in the live version in a second. But um, just to talk a little bit about how we came up with these scores, because that seems to be, that is a huge uh, set of decisions. Uh, we have first to identify a target. Um, in many cases, we'll do the long-term mean of the data set. And this is justifiable because many uh, forest responses to, forest ecosystem responses to stress really have to do with deviation from the norm. So if things change wildly, it's harder for the system to adapt to those changes. We could also choose to minimize or maximize a certain value. So if we just think that uh, something like uh, maple syrup production should always be more, more, more is better, then you can maximize that. Or if you want to minimize the amount of disturbance by invasive pests, that would be a minimized choice. Or you could uh, agree to it, you could set the score relative to an agreed upon ideal. I mentioned precipitation acidity is generally uh, considered neutral at 5.5 pH. So that's a target that's in the literature that we can uh, shoot for and score against. So we first have to set the target and then we have to calculate the latest year score. So if we're using the long-term mean, here on the left you see that the score is how far away is this year's value from that long-term mean. If we're doing a minimize, say this is for forest pests and, or for invasive exotics, and we wanna minimize the amount of damage in the state happening to forests because of that pest, uh, you'd be shooting for the minimum. And here, if we have an agreed upon ideal, you can look at how far away we are from that. So that's how we score each individual data set. Um, and then we combine those data sets into these categories that were shown before. And to do that, we had to weight them against each other. So these are all converted to scores and then weighted. And these weights are picked by our uh, technical review panel. And then each of these uh, categories 
are equally weighted to provide that overall score that you see on the front page for the website. So enough PowerPoint, I'm gonna switch over to the web and go to the indicators dashboard. So when you first land on the page, we provide this uh, pop-up. Uh, you can always get back to this um, by clicking the little I button in the top right. Let's provide some basic background information, disclaimer, and a lot of other information that I'll come back to. So closing that, you see the view of the indicators dashboard um, with each of these options. Uh, hovering over the category, you can get a little pop-up with some of uh, one sentence of what that means. Uh, hovering over the score reminds you of how it's uh, determined and the color of the circle and what that means. So we provide this information throughout the dashboard as hovers so that people can get more information on what we're showing them. Uh, for this, I'm going to click on condition and we can look at what's there in that category. Um, so here, condition is the overall health and status of trees in the forest. So you see this overview of the category, um, my condition score up here, and then the individual data sets that I can click on to, to go into more detail. Scrolling down, we can see more information on uh, how we quantify condition in these various pieces. So these are just small summaries of each of the constituent data sets so someone can get a quick overview and some resources, uh, other resources that they can access if they want to learn more. So if I were to click on, say, crown dieback, I now can look at the exact indicator change in this data set. So looking at this, uh, this is actually coming from two networks of forest uh, monitoring programs in Vermont and composite dieback. And you can see that there's a trend, an increasing trend over time. Um, so the circle is red because that trend is statistically different from zero. And the score for 2017 is 3.6 because we're moving away from the long-term mean. So I can get a little bit more information about uh, how this was calculated. If I click here, it gives you a lot of information on interpreting the score and the trend, and then details on the calculation. What did we, what's the latest date of year? What's the scoring mean? What's the target value? How do we determine what's quote unquote good or worse is the directionality of scores. And if I want to, I can access that um, project here in the FEMC archive. Scrolling further down, um, you see the, you can hover over and get the composite values, the actual dieback values for all species for per year. Um, you can also save this chart. Um, you can print it, you can download a PNG or a PDF of this chart if you want to. Um, scrolling further down, there's a little bit more detail on what this metric is capturing and also a link to the project on the FEMC archive that has the data that went into it. So when clicking over here, I can get some information on the project, including how many data sets there are um, available for this project. Um, going back up, there's, if we look say at stressors, we can see an example of a success story. One that's very well known in Vermont is the uh, reduction in acid, acid rain that we've seen. Uh, here I mentioned the ideal, we score that trend against the ideal. So when I click on this, I can see that um, the target value is 5.6, which is a pH of neutral rain. Higher values are better. I'm scoring against the minimum and that maximum value. So I, we're not there yet, but we're getting better. Um, it's a statistically significant increase in pH over time. Something like uh, looking at forest structure, uh, we have softwood regeneration that has been actually uh, showing a, a very variable pattern. So we can see that there's no discernible linear trend in this data. So that's why it gets a yellow circle because the scores are not changing over time. And here we're scoring it against the long-term mean. So just seeing a stable software regeneration over time is, is what we consider quote unquote good for this. Um, and right now we're kind of there, we're oscillating around some mean. If we look instead at hardwood re regeneration as represented by sugar maple, we actually see a, a somewhat troubling decline in the regeneration recorded on forest inventory and analysis plots. Um, so this is a, an example of a, of a downward trend that uh, might be of concern to policymakers and decision makers. Um, the last piece, so this is how you would move around the dashboard. You can get more information on those trends by clicking here. You can, or sorry, on the scores, you can get more information on the data and sources and additional sources of data and information on the bottom. And the last piece I wanted to show is that you can look at 
um, some more detailed methods and background here. So we provide a brief overview of the project, some background on how it was built. Um, we also provide uh, some pretty detailed methods pages. Um, here's an overview and the terminology we use. Um, and you can also click on the view methods for here to see the specific methods for say stand complexity. So we'll provide pretty detailed information on the data that went in, how it was weighted, and, um, and some uh, background information. If you're not sure how to do something or have some more questions, the fre frequently asked questions is a good place to start. Um, we do acknowledge the, the significant effort provided by a lot of our partners in the technical review. And one other piece that I think hopefully will be useful to people is our ability to cite versions. So we have, um, as, all, as you can imagine, all these data sets can change over time. Um, we're adding new data points uh, every day, every week, every month, every year, depending on the data set. But we've actually provided um, snap shots of the dashboard because as we change these as we update these data sets the scores will change and um, rather than viewing that as a problem we view that as an opportunity so based on the date stamp um, you can actually access previous versions of data so i can click on say this um at the most recent version we added a number of new indicators and updated some uh, previous calculations if we go back to the version 1.3 we can actually see that the scores are going to be different because the calculations were done differently and we had different data sets so um, this is an older version of the dashboard um, so as we make changes to the data sets over time this these uh, will change, but we can always access the previous version um, and cite a specific version of the date of the dashboard, um, which makes it easy to uh, makes it easier for users to kind of reference back to that exact copy that you were using when you wrote a report or made a graphic. So that's going to be available again through this I button here on the side. Um, so going forward, um, we intend to keep maintaining the data sets and updating, providing regular updates to the indicators as new data becomes available. We um, are continually evaluating if there's other data that need to go into here, although we're pretty comfortable with the current suite of data. There's a number of data sets we would love to include, but we just don't have, such as on invasive plants. There's no um, monitoring level data set that we could use for that. Uh, and we also are going to be working uh, over the next nine months with policymakers and decision makers on how we can further improve this dashboard to make it easy to integrate and use in uh, advocacy work and policy and planning processes. Um, so we're looking for uh, help from uh, people on how to envision that and how to do that. So if anyone is interested in uh, helping with that, please get in touch. Um, going back to the uh, so going back to the slides really quickly, um, I just wanted to run th to kind of show you some of the uh, data sets that go into each of these categories. They're also listed there on the side at the website, so you might have already seen them. Um, but just put these up as we're going through to kind of display the diversity of the information that we have. Um, for stressors, we're really looking at a lot of climate drivers as well as pollution drivers and damage from invasive pests specifically. For forest condition, we're looking at dieback, damage to trees, growth and, and mortality of, uh, on the forest scale and on a tree scale, canopy density from remote sensing, and then damage and decay metrics um, to indicate uh, types of damage and levels of damage. Looking at ecosystem services, we've digitized a lot of information on timber harvests. Uh, we use some stream indicator species data, hunting uh, production from forests, uh, carbon storage, maple syrup production, recreation rates, and forest bird diversity from across the state. So that concludes the end of the presentation and kind of show and tell that we wanted to give. Um, here's some contact information for the people uh, at FEMC, some of us who worked on this. Um, so I'm going to switch over really quick to the uh, Q&A. I see that there are two questions posted there. Um, so I'll read through those and then we can answer them. So the first is, are there any plans to make it more regionally scalable? Planners need access to information at a county, such as a regional planning commission and a municipal level. As structured, this tool may have value to the periodic planning done at the agency level, but is of limited value to the local and regional planning. I realize many data sets may be geographically challenged, but even reporting at eco-regional level would help. So that's a really great question. And it was a challenge that we looked at is if we could provide more spatially explicit information. Um, unfortunately, many of the data sets are either 
um, from several sites, one of several sites. So for example, ozone, we have two points in the state where we measure ozone. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's not gonna give us much ecoregional specificity. So it was one challenge that we had. And the other was to look at um, if we could uh, say enough about a region with a limited subset of data. So even FIA data on a county or, or regional planning commission or a town level could be um, pretty limited. Uh, the hope is that at least this provides a way to understand the trends and then you can access the original data if you wanna try and do an analysis at the um, town or municipal level. Uh, whether this is something that could be recreated at a smaller scale, I, I'm a little skeptical of, but if we were to scale it up to other states, many of these data sets are actually available at, uh, in other states. So having something say for New Hampshire or for Massachusetts would uh, not be much additional work. The, the infrastructure and the way this is built, it'd be very easy to scale this up and scale this out. Um, <clears throat> looking at the next question, says, any plans to include land use change data, particularly in coordination with work done by Vermont Natural Resources Council? <clears throat> um, absolutely. So if we had had more time before this webinar, we would have included the parcelization data that they have just, uh, they're about to release. Um, it's a temporal data set that we can actually use to understand how forest parcels are being cut up into smaller and smaller pieces in the state. And those trend information would be clearly valuable in thinking about what kind of is putting stress on forest, staying forest. Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is uh, better metrics for forest cover. Right now, uh, we're limited to either forest inventory and analysis assessments of forest cover or to national land cover data sets assessments of forest cover, um, that both of those have their problems in the state of Vermont. Uh, so we're actually looking at developing some remote sensing workflows that we can get uh, more regular, uh, some more regular information to, some more, uh, sorry, what am I trying to say? More temporally explicit, so having finer time scales on that data so that we can look at trends and forest cover over time. Because right now we have three to five data points and it's not enough to look at trends. So thank you for that question. So yeah, land cover data and land use change data are coming online now. And I'm, I'm optimistic that VNRC's product is something that's gonna stay updated over time so that we'll have this continuing evolving record of how parcels on forest land are changing. Are there any other questions that people would like to ask? Well, great. Well, I want to say uh, thank you again to, oops, let me just check. Okay, um, so I, I want to thank you again for taking the time to uh, learn a little bit about this tool and we would love to hear from you if there's additional suggestions you have on how we can improve this or other work that we can do, um, other ways to make this useful or if you want an expanded presentation on this with your organization or agency. Uh, we really do see this as something that's going to be dynamic and flexible and, and want to work with our cooperative members to make it even more useful. So um, thank you very much. Uh, I'll also mention that we're doing another webinar on our Forest Health Atlas in a couple of weeks. And you can find information about that on our website and our newsfeed. And to uh, make sure to hold a date on December 14th for the annual conference of the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative happening here in Burlington uh, all day on the 14th and should be a, a raucous good time. So thank you everyone. Enjoy the changing weather and I look forward to seeing some of you again soon.